While virtual reality tends to be an individualistic immersion into the digital realm, the shared immersive experience offers the added perspective of an audience dynamic. This shared experience is possible in places such as dome theatres and planetaria. Dome theatres or planetaria aim to immerse and transport the audience collectively to visualise especially scientific concepts and knowledge. A trip to Tokyo in 2017 resulted in my developing a new perspective on the language inherent in these systems. Good day. I am Leon Sneemann from the Adown School of Music and the Naval Hill Planetarium at the University of the Free State based in Bloemfontein, South Africa, birthplace of J.R.R. Tolkien. Join me on a journey. In 2017, I attended the Data to Dome workshop at the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan's headquarters at Mitaka, a suburb in the south of Tokyo. The Data to Dome movement has gained traction as these shared immersive systems allow scientists and researchers to experience their data in ways not possible on a flat screen in the laboratory. I have deliberately said experience, as there is a growing interest in using auditory interpretations of data too. But I digress. This workshop was followed by the International Festival of Scientific Visualization at Galaxy City in Adashi, Tokyo. After the first day of this festival, where each film, even those produced in Anglophile countries, was in Japanese, my hosts at my guest house thought that a better translation of the festival's title would be the Festival of Scientific Visualization with International Content. It was aimed at a Japanese as opposed to an international audience. And I am about as fluent in Japanese as I am in Klingon. Still, it led to some interesting deductions. I sat with a Hollywood producer of Full Dome Films and a Canadian distributor, because we were linguistically in the same boat, trying to work out what scientific argument each successive film dealt with. The producer's comments on each film became a loud litany of more circles, more orbit lines. Despite my embarrassment, I eventually began to notice what he was getting at. Regardless of whether the film dealt with string theory or the northern lights, they all looked similar and all were trapped within the circular confines of the dome. My last morning in Tokyo, I was off to Wena Park, which is surrounded by several museums. My first stop was the Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum, which at the time housed the Titian and the Renaissance in Venice exhibition. Here I was in the Far East, looking at high Western art. Not long into the exhibition, I was struck by a thought. Venice is where the shift from a single-point perspective to a two-point perspective reached a climax in the realism portrayed on canvas during the Renaissance. Basically, the canvas is just part of the whole composition. The painting extends outwards beyond what is seen. And suddenly, what I had experienced in the preceding week all came together. And I was struck with the thought that this is the major problem with planetaria and domed films. They have to break out of the single-point circular perspective and expand their language. Back home at the Naval Hill Planetarium in Bloemfontein, it's not so much that productions have not pushed the boundaries as it were, especially with regard to integrated live performances. The building that houses the planetarium was originally built as a Lamont Hussey Observatory for the University of Michigan and converted to the Observatory Theatre when the actual observatory was decommissioned. From the start of its life as a planetarium, though, the idea has been to use the space for extra astronomical functions and even concerts. And, to this end, a baby grand is permanently housed within the space. Following on from individual experiments, such as a projected slideshow with pianist Nicole Fulhoun for Bastille Day and Edith Piaf's birthday in 2015, Fly Me to the Planets was conceived as a fully integrated music and full dome show. Written for a brass quintet and percussion duo, performing music from the classical and jazz repertoire and TV and film music, the production used different dome systems for different items in the show. For instance, the first movement, Allegro, of Mozart's Eine kleine Nachtmusik, Serenade No. 13 in G, is accompanied by a panoramic view of Salzburg, painted by Johann Suttler, a contemporary of the composer, projected under the virtual view of the night sky as it would have appeared the night of the composer's birth.
Gustav Holst's work for double orchestra, The Planets, is reduced to seven players and about 17 minutes, drawing the essence out of the work. The music arrangements define the visual elements. The idea of just looking at spinning planets in front of the audience seems to be a waste, not to mention boring. As Holst wrote the work mainly from an astrological as opposed to a strictly astronomical perspective, each movement started with a description of the mythical characteristics of the planet and its musical identity before flying to the planet and then onto each of the planet's moons. Four infographic cards on the sides of the dome gave details of the astronomical characteristics comparing the planets to each other. Unfortunately, live performances of this nature with musicians are expensive to stage. This is partly why Diode, Digital Instrument Orchestra and Dome Experience, has been put on hold. In this production, the ensemble explore the elements of unique digital and electronic instruments. Apart from the standard digital instruments of the music world, a few unusual instruments are also in the lineup, such as the electronic wind instrument, or iwi, which is an instrument that uses clarinet or sax fingering to produce a six octave range of changeable electronic and acoustically sampled sounds. The digital drum set and keyboard work in a similar fashion to their respective acoustic instrument counterparts. The electric violin, not strictly a digital instrument, uses pickups and expression pedals to expand the sounds of the acoustic instrument. The theremin is a unique electroacoustic instrument which is the only instrument played without physical contact by the musician. The dome complements the music with visuals enhancing the immersive experience. More than astronomy is explored on the dome as the makeup of the ensemble opens up the possibility to explore visuals using fractals and other unique influences. We have also tried our hand at drama productions. Some of these were cheaper to stage. Our first sojourn into this world was an Afrikaans rendering by Naomi Morgan of The Little Prince which we later repeated both in Afrikaans and in English. This made use of images superimposed over asteroid belts and panoramas for the earthbound scenes. We eventually made use of Anton de saint exuberys sketches where possible. Actor Chris von Nickek brought the story to life from behind the author's desk under the dome. In the blind drawn dark dining room of schoolhouse, dusty and echoing as a dining room in a vault, Mr. and Mrs. Pugh are silent over cold grey cottage pie. Mr. Pugh reads, as he forks the shroud meat in, from the lives of the great poisoners. He has bound a plain brown paper cover around the book. Slide Dylan Thomas's Under Milkwood was staged by an amateur group as though recording a radio drama of 55 voices with 10 performers in a studio eyes, using live foley and sound effects. Reading. Alone in the hissing laboratory of his wishes, Mr. Pugh minces among bad vats and Jeroboams, tiptoes Probably the most unplanetarium feature in all the productions was attempted by using a full-down view of a fishing village set in the southern cape so as not to have to try to replicate 55 whale shakes. The dome changed imperceptibly above the audience from one spring night to the next. And on the dome, the sea actually moved. You know... Best, my dear, says Mr. Pugh, and quick as a flash, he ducks her in rat soup. What's that book? Why 
by a trough, Mr. Pugh. It's a theological work, my dear. Lives of the Great Saints. I saw you talking to a saint this morning, Saint Polly Garter. She was martyred again last night. But I always think, as we tumble into bed, of little Willy Wee, who is dead, dead, dead. The Wounded Healer, an original production by Johann Rousseau, is an in-depth contemplation of the consequences of the cost to oneself of the commitment to one's career and calling, an exploration of the ethics behind the everyday decisions. Albeit that a trauma surgeon, and thus the work is situated within the medical profession, is the protagonist, the work speaks to anyone who is in a profession which demands commitment and sacrifice beyond the standard work week. Various visual elements are used from panoramas of Hong Kong and the Guru to full dome fisheye perspectives of the award dinner in the story. Sound again was live, performed by the writer himself. A planned project, War of the Worlds 2, would use sound to disorient the audience. While it is easy to cause motion sickness under a dome, here the idea was to try to recreate the unease and panic of the original Orson Welles radio broadcast with a planetarium audience without causing nausea. Using sound, once the security checks have been passed, the seating descends 25 stories into Naver Hill to a secret bunker where scientists start the briefing. H.G. Wells wrote the science fiction work War of the Worlds over 120 years ago in 1898, ten years after the first photograph of Mars was taken and the theory developed that Mars had water channels on it and therefore life. Over 80 years ago, Orson Welles' radio adaption caused panic in America and a few months later the first color photograph ever of Mars was taken in Bloemfontein. This production uses live actors and the dome to explore the invasion of the Earth by the Martians War of the Worlds, but then continues to explore the developments in the technology and astronomy that has allowed humans to now send probes and rovers to Mars. We have now invaded the Red Planet, and there will be repercussions. Hence, War of the Worlds 2. But will there be a new invasion of Earth by the Martians? And what if the Martians use the Moon as a base for their attack, turning it red? But here's the thing. All these shows are either unplugged for the most part, as in Fly Me to the Planets, or can only be linked up in stereo, as in the drama pieces. The pre-rendered planetarium films, dealing mainly with astronomy, use a 5.1 surround sound system. Already the slicing, as the procedure is called, to render the film in a format suitable for showing on the individual systems at each planetarium or dome theatre, is determined for each theatre depending on its size, shape and projection system. The film is supplied as a series of still images, generally 30 images or frames per second of film, called a dome master, and in the resolution of the projection system that the planetarium or dome can handle. In Bloemfontein we have a 4K system, in Cape Town 8K. At least the sound is fairly standardized, at either a stereo or a 5.1 surround sound system, but this is not necessarily the best solution for immersive sound. We are working on a full dome film project called Mars or Man's Amped Rubicon Supplements, which has an android packing Martian soil as the new rhino horn to treat fevers back on Earth. But the android learns and becomes creative and begins to sculpt the contents of the vials until the scientists reboot the android and the process then repeats itself until eventually the android is discarded in the Martian soil. The humans are still polluting. The uncreative android sees in monochrome and in cinemascope, and as it learns and becomes creative, color is introduced and the image moves to the full dome. Here's a bit of what is happening in the soundtrack. The soundtrack draws from Hoss' first movement, Mars, the bringer of war, from the planets, and David Bowie's Is There Life on Mars? Hoss' Mars has five beats in a bar, and the thematic material has a distinctive rhythmic element. Bowie's Is Their Life on Mars features a harmonic progression with a descending bass line in semitones. In the film's Mars theme, the rhythmic elements pick up on Hulse's patterns, five beats though over two bars now, and the rhythmic theme is quoted verbatim 
albeit with added melodic elements. The work is bitonal, with a fourth between the tuba and marimba keys, Mars being the fourth planet in the solar system. Each instrument follows the harmonic progression of the Bowie song in their own key. LVXI, or 5511, is a 55 speaker sound installation using an excerpt from Ovid's Metamorphoses, which compares the four stages of life to the four seasons. The South African languages were supposed to be vehicles of unity through diversity, but have become symbols of division, a clamoring noise, obscuring meaning and communication. But if you listen closely, really listen, individual voices can still be heard and sense and meaning carry through despite the chaos. The installation uses 12 Raspberry Pi computers running 55 speakers and 11 vocal groups of five voices each, with each group in one of the 11 official South African languages. Unfortunately, the complexity of this setup would probably not allow this system to be a useful alternative to the 5.1 surround sound systems found in most planet areas. Nigel Hellyer from Macquarie University in Australia uses DNA sequenced from encoding of a piece of music. The DNA is then allowed to mutate and eventually is re-encoded into music, a sound interpretation of a scientific data set. In this version, a transcription of a Khoisan piece, Sangora, was DNA'd, mutated, and then arranged for three members of the Adayan String Quartet. He has since run other versions of the same concept. As far as the use of sound in these environments go, there are two areas that are problematic. The first is how to determine which elements in the data sets determine which sound elements. There is no standardized protocol as to which sound characteristic represents which scientific principle or element. The second is the system itself. The standard audio 5.1 system is not the easiest to mix for, and the speakers are generally placed around the base of the dome, so the options are not too extensive. Still, the potential to develop a standardized means of producing sound and music in these spaces exists. Both with regard to the development of audio systems, as well as determining a language for translating data sets into understandable audio representations. I thank you. Stop.